Everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hope you're all doing well, making progress on learning Chemi 435, staying safe. Let me share my screen. Got a full day today. Okay, so I want you guys to help me understand, help me and the TAs understand about um, your level of knowledge for Aspen. So you're gonna use the thumb up and thumb down um, to answer a couple questions for me. You can see me kind of toggling it. Hopefully you've all seen this by now. Um, so uh, if you've used Aspen, the chemical process simulator before, go ahead and uh, give me thumbs up. Take another second. Okay, got about half of you, not bad. Um, and it looks like about two thirds have used it before. So numbers slowly climbing. Okay, second question. Um, if you're comfortable designing a flash drum or any kind of separator in Aspen, uh, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Okay, that's that's plenty. Um, we are going to probably or certainly take some class time on Thursday to introduce Aspen. So um, I'll, I'll start from the beginning uh, and kind of the second half of class on Thursday and give a broad introduction. And then I'll work with the TAs um, to figure out maybe adding an additional session um, that could be recorded or just using the recitations. And we will um, you know, kind of get back to you on how we want to proceed. We do want to use Aspen potentially even for a quiz, uh, but certainly for a homework and as a project later in the class. So now's the time that we need to kind of help everybody get up to speed. And um, I've taught Kemi 375 seven or eight times in the past, and I'm very comfortable with Aspen, uh, as are the TAs. So nothing to worry about there. We'll give you lots of resources for getting started. And it's about the right time in the quarter anyway, given where we're at and what we've learned. One of the things that we'll be doing is sort of uh, in the beginning using Aspen to check some of our calculations that we're doing by hand. And that's always a really good experience if you're able to use a completely independent method and get the same answer um, in, in chemical process design. So um, yeah, you can anticipate that we'll start that on Thursday. Uh, Jeremy's here today in class. So uh, send questions to him with the chat tool if you have them. Or again, um, use the raise hand feature if you want to, um, uh, unmute your mic and ask a question yourself. Either way is totally fine with me. Um, I've updated the reading guide. Sorry, I forgot to do that over the last weekend, but I'll make sure that that stays current now. And then um, I'll do a quick recap and we're gonna jump right into um, connecting the knowledge that you have from Thermo 2 about vapor liquid equilibrium to design and analysis of this flat, um, first unit operations that we're, we're gonna look at called the flash drum or flash separator. Um, and then let me reminder to set my timer. Um, the break activity is totally optional, but uh, that's gonna leave that all up to you. And I don't really wanna know if you're having your own dance party, but whatever you want. Um, we'll take a break in about a half hour. So just a quick recap from uh, last Thursday. I know there was a number of questions I heard from the TAs. I, I had good conversation with several of you at office hours. Um, any additional quick questions that I can answer, um, please don't at this moment ask a question that kind of requires me to go over the whole lecture again. I, I won't have time for that, but i um, happy to take any quick questions or uh, refer you to other resources or, or um, office hours, things like that. I'm going to wait just a moment and see if I see anything either um, from uh, one of the students or the TAs, etc. While I'm waiting, I, I'm not, uh, it says in the syllabus, but I'll, as a reminder, my office hours tomorrow are canceled on Wednesday afternoon. I will have my Friday office hours. And if you do want um, to schedule additional time with me, just send a note and I'll, I'll add some additional time. Okay, I'm not seeing any additional questions coming in from um, the TAs or 
any of you in Zoom. So let's kind of jump into today's content. And we're gonna talk about uh, kind of big picture, this concept of what a flash separator is. And then I'm gonna show you a couple industrial examples of what they look like in a plant. And then we will get into the actual nuts and bolts of designing a flash separator. So uh, a good example can be found in oil refining. And as you probably know, when you take crude oil from the ground, it's a, a very complex mixture of thousands, if not hundreds, if not, you know, a thousand or more molecules. And these molecules have um, some similar properties, but they also have uh, really widely varying boiling points. So a very common unit operation is a reactor um, that's called a cracker. And what we see in, in cracking of uh, olefins and hydrocarbons is a uh, kind of breaking down of that carbon backbone and separating into very small molecules. In this little block flow diagram I drew here, um, there's one component in particular that I labeled flare, and that's because there's often times a very low value molecule that's created that has a very, very uh, low boiling point. Uh, so it'd be, have a very high vapor pressure at standard conditions. And as a result, we don't want to do anything with that. And so um, a flare product in a refinery or a chemical plant is actually just burned. So they send it up the stack to the top of the plant. Um, they light that vapor stream on fire and they emit um, the combustion products as a way to um, kind of dispose of the material. I know it's not ideal, but it's a kind of central component in dealing with crude oil refining. So in order to separate that, that light boiling component, and so in my example here, um, it's component D, in order to separate that component, um, we, we often don't have to do something complex like distillation or uh, any other unit operation. We can um, take advantage of the fact that we have this huge separation in boiling point. And so that manifests itself, you might remember um, from the first week by having this really large um, separation factor alpha. So alpha is the ratio of the partition coefficient, Ki being the vapor liquid equilibrium partition coefficient. And when that ratio is much, much greater than one, um, it's very easy to make a separation. So in cases where we use flash to separate one or more components, the separation factor for in this example here, D, has to be huge compared to all the other components. So that's why I wrote alpha D J. So D is huge for all the components. And basically what happens um, is that we will adjust the temperature or pressure so this may possibly involve, as I'm labeling here in this block flow diagram, the use of a pump and or a, a heater. Uh, it depends on the scenario. And then we emit that stream into a large vessel. And basically, we just allow phases to separate. So the temperature and pressure are chosen in order to ensure that there'll be phase separation. And in this example here that I'm drawing, this little silly example, uh, we would expect basically a perfect separation or near perfect separation. So all of component D, whatever it is, might be something like um, CO2, methane, something like that. All of that would be, get separated into the vapor phase. And the basic design consideration of the flash drum is selecting the correct temperature and pressure in order to achieve this, uh, the separation that we want. So uh, flash drums are very common. Uh, you'll learn how to actually calculate their size in Chemi 485 next winter. And there's another type of separator that works on the same principle. It's called a partial condenser. So partial condensers work basically the same way, except you're dealing with primarily a vapor stream. And you have a very, um, you know, will be a very tiny separation factor, um, which would allow you to, uh, you know, much, much, much less than one, which um, would allow a component to be taken into the liquid phase. So in industry, um, flash drums have a huge variety in shape, size, and format. They often operate at really high pressure. And so there's a kind of two examples here, vertical and horizontal flash drums, separators. And I just wanna draw your attention to what might be one of your first examples of seeing a, a really high pressure vessel. I'll zoom in on that really quick. Look at the huge number of, um, of bolts that is uh, keeping the top of that vessel uh, connected to the bottom. So you, you can, begin to imagine just from looking at different pieces of process equipment, uh, different conditions they might operate in. Um, this is a much larger flash drum right here, this, this horizontal one. And um, I just note, because we haven't done a lot of process design in the past, this is something that 
I'll try and talk about. I do have some industrial experience related to process design, but when you're designing a continuous plant that's gonna have a lot of process streams, maybe dozens or even a hundred unit operations all interconnected, there's a lot of value in having um, a large vessel like this in which you may have a standing level of liquid. We call that hold up, um, liquid hold up. And the purpose of that is to allow the process to be tolerant to small disruptions or perturbations. So all of these processes are connected with different pipes. Um, and if, if there's no intermediate stages where there's liquid kind of resting there, then if one pump, for example, ran out of electricity or you were switching over to a backup, there's a lot of, lot of uh, scenarios you investigate when you're running new processes or designing new processes. Uh, if you had a short disruption of a pump and you had no intermediate phase where um, you could continue to flow liquid at basically the same rate, you could have a massive disruption of your whole process. So sometimes you see these flash separators that are really oversized because they also um, kind of serve a dual purpose of having these, uh, what we call kind of a hold up drum. So I'll try throughout the quarter, and this is I think one of the benefits of um, forcing me to rethink my lectures, I'll try and really include a lot of examples of what the unit operation looks like in industry so that you guys can begin to imagine um, what you're learning in the classroom and some of the examples and how that would translate to design of some of these larger unit operations. And um, we haven't probably done that in too many classes in the past, maybe heat transfer. So the first thing we're gonna do today is um, do binary separation, binary flash design uh, using graphical vapor liquid equilibrium data. Um, we'll see on Thursday, there are cases where we uh, do graphical design with ternary systems. And um, that covers a different type of separator, but normally in uh, flash and distillation, uh, where it's gonna be all binary. So um, getting used to looking at these VLE diagrams, uh, as I noted, I think on the first day of class can actually begin to give you a lot of instinct and knowledge about how easy a particular separation is going to be. Because in these VLE data that we often look at graphically, there's a ton of uh, information encoded there. So it's really a matter of learning what to look for. Um, and just as a kind of note, we're gonna be doing a lot of hand calculations in this class because that's what gives you instinct, um, kind of that engineering uh, intuition, that chemical engineering instinct. You get that from working on these simple problems where you can really easily understand how changing one variable will change the whole outcome of your design process. I'm gonna review these two important types of uh, VLE data and just highlight some of the key points. Um, and I'll just kind of note, in almost all the cases that I can think of where we're gonna do these uh, calculations um, of binary problems, we are gonna not really consider pressure drops. So systems are gonna be almost entirely at constant pressure. And as we get later in the quarter and we start designing things like membranes, or systems with only gases flowing over a column of beads, we call that like a packed column, um, pressure drop becomes really important. So I'm not saying that pressure drop is not important at all in 435. It's just in the next couple of weeks when we're designing these certain types of separators, we will not be considering pressure drop too often. And the data we're looking at will certainly be uh, constant pressure unless I very clearly noted otherwise. So um, one of the first types of diagrams that you're accustomed to seeing is a TXY diagram. Um, so in the TXY diagram, we um, have a couple important things we need to remember. Um, the diagram shows kind of three regimes. So um, we typically use the mole fraction of the more volatile species um, on the x-axis. And then um, we can always calculate because it's binary, the mole fraction of the less volatile species. Um, these diagrams have a bunch of different forms, but this is a really common one. And the blue region represents a saturated liquid. So it's a one phase region. So you can get there by being at a certain temperature or pressure. The red region represents a saturated vapor. And the, um, the gray region in the middle is a two phase region. So if you have any composition and temperature that matches that, um, we, would, we would expect to be a two phase region and establishing vapor liquid equilibrium. Uh, we'll need this on Thursday as well. So if you're not familiar or you've never seen uh, tie lines and the lever rule, uh, I'll briefly revisit it on Thursday, but I'm assuming some knowledge of that 
from prior classes. The other type of diagram we look at is the XY diagram. And so here in the XY diagram, what we've done is um, a bunch of experiments in the two phase region where um, we expect there to be vapor liquid equilibrium. And um, what we do here in uh, the flash calculation, I'll show you in a minute, is focus on relating the feed composition into a separator. In, this, in today's example, it'll be the flash drum and determining very quickly the composition of um, the vapor and liquid phases that are coming out of that separator. So one of the things, as I noted, beginning to think about um, developing some of that intuition, you, you should be able to look at um, this XY diagram uh, when it's measured at constant pressure and begin to work out, for example, where is the system at higher and lower temperature? If you go back to the definition of the partition coefficient, um, remember Ki is the ratio from the um, um, vapor to liquid phases. And um, we can also begin to imagine where we have very large or small uh, partition coefficients at a given point in our column and begin to imagine whether the separation is uh, kind of easier or less easy. So before we get into VLE design, there's one other case that we really have to begin to learn about. and We'll, we'll revisit it in distillation design. And that's the example of uh, an azeotrope. And um, so azeotrope was a word that was kind of invented. It's not a real word, but um, it uses a couple of Greek um, um, components to roughly come up with this definition that means something like no change in boiling. And so the definition of an azeotrope is that you're at a composition. So azeotropes are uh, always referred to a composition. And you're at a composition where if you add more heat to that liquid, the, the composition of the vapor leaving that liquid stream is exactly equal to the composition of the liquid. So um, that's not what we've been used to talking about so far because we've had this idea that we're going to enrich the vapor in the more volatile component. But some non-ideal systems uh, reach a point where you can no longer do that, and then the system is said to be at an azeotrope. So what that looks like on the XY diagram is the following. So um, we could, at, at, low version, at low values of X, we could have a pretty good separation factor, and we're seeing that um, that diagram's looking good. We can, we can really enrich the vapor phase in our more volatile component. And then at some point, when that, um, when that line touches the 45 degree line, that point right there is the azeotrope. And so the, the composition of, of y is exact, uh, of x and y are equal. So any, any point right here, for example, if you have a mixture, say that that's like uh, xa is 90%, the vapor phase is also gonna be equal to 90%. So that's an important thing to understand because a separator based on ESA, like an energy separating agent that we're talking about today or with distillation, can't work. There's no ability to use uh, a distillation column to enrich our system beyond the azeotrope right here. So in separations design, and we'll see uh, maybe some examples of this, um, we, we say that we need to sort of uh, what's called break the azeotrope. So what that means is we typically are adding an, a third component or an additional component where there may be uh, a change in the VLE curve. So that's totally possible with non-ideal solutions. We could add something that then creates driving force for separation. Or um, we could turn to a different type of separation, maybe liquid-liquid extraction or some other me method in order to move the system beyond this. Um, one of the classic examples uh, where, where this becomes really important is in ethanol and water se uh, separation and in the production of um, biofuels. So you may know that um, when we produce ethanol from fermentation, um, it's, it's a stream that comes out of that fermenter bath that's very uh, water rich. So you can't really in, um, ferment a broth, you know, typically depends on the, uh, the strain, 15 to 20% alcohol by volume is, is kind of typical. If you're gonna make a fuel grade ethanol, um, you need to get that to above 99.7, I think is the, the fuel standard. And the ethanol water azeotrope is well below that. 
So the separation of ethanol and water in biofuels plants or in the um, kind of food, uh, the food industry, if you're trying to make 100, you know, um, uh, 200 proof alcohol, uh, that's totally pure, you need an additional way to do the separation. So um, in Chemi 437, there's an experiment that explores that and you'll learn a little more about that process there. But the, the, the one example I would say every Chemi always knows about is ethanol water separation um, and, and the azeotrope kind of being at a very high ethanol content. Um, azeotropes can also be identified on the TXY diagram. So um, what we see here, is that there is a point in which the vapor and liquid envelopes um, come into contact. Remember this is the red region's all vapor, this is liquid, and then that's the two-phase region. And so when the vapor um, envelope uh, touches the liquid envelope, there is a, a separation and this, this uh, signifies an azeotrope. And the shape here, the one that's drawn is what's called a positive azeotrope. And what that means is that the boiling point of the mixture, so which would be signified here, that would be the, the boiling point of that mixture, is lower than the boiling point of either pure component, which are here at the edges of this diagram. Um, there's also a negative azeotrope where this you can imagine this diagram is flipped entirely upside down. So uh, we won't use these diagrams in this class, but it's um, for, for design of separators. But it's, it's always good to remember kind of what that, you know, that important concept of the azeotrope is and how it can be identified. So I'm going to just pause just for a moment in case there's any questions people might have. Um, and again, send that. I just moved Jeremy to the top of the participant list. Sorry, he wasn't there before. Um, and um, so a question that just came into me was, are we gonna deal with heteroazeotropes at all? Uh, and the answer is no, uh, we won't. We will probably um, play with uh, an azeotropic system in Aspen a little bit and maybe do some binary distillation design uh, around a system like the ethanol water system with, with a diagram that would look something um, kind of like this, uh, where you can really clearly identify the azeotrope in um, the VLE curve. So. Um, We'll have one or two example problems, but in general, we're going to stay more toward ideal problems and um, in order to kind of nail down the concepts that we need. Okay, so let's turn our attention now to uh, the design of a flash separator. And I want to kind of walk you through the block flow diagram here um, on the right and make sure all the, the key variables are known and, and we're going to use this common set of variables because they're in the book and um, kind of all your problems will use them. So a flash separator has a feed stream F, has a vapor outstream V and a liquid outstream L. One of the kind of defining features of the problems that we'll work on uh, here and in distillation is that we typically, for the purpose of solving some mass balances, is we'll define this variable Z and ZA is the mole fraction of uh, all phases. So we haven't said anything about the phase of F coming in. It could be uh, super cooled. It could be an equilibrium kind of um, bubble point mixture. It could be two phase, could be a dew point mixture, it could be superheated. So there's a bunch of different scenarios that F could be in. And our initial analysis is really just gonna require the overall mole fraction. So, um, when we do these binary systems, they also have to be at constant pressure. And we have to have the VLE data for the AD system in order to do graphical design. And our goal here is co to completely specify the mole balance. So that means all flows and all compositions uh, for this system. So I'm gonna show you a kind of a method for doing that next. And this method works for flash drums and we will use it in a few weeks when we begin to do um, distillation design. So binary distillation design will have some common elements to what we're doing. Okay, so um, let me kind of walk you through a first example for um, flash design. And so here we always have to, we're gonna talk about degrees of freedom in a moment, 
But in this example, don't worry about that and just know that we're given the following. We have the initial composition, ZA, for this binary system. And we're also given this variable V over S. So that's, that's always called the fraction of the feed that's vaporized. And that's sort of like a control variable. It tells us, um, based on the pressure and temperature that we're at in that flash dome, how much of the stream is going to leave as vapor and how much of it will leave as liquid. So um, what you do in order to analyze the system is the following. So first, we prepare the XY diagram, so the VLE curve. Uh, we have that here. I've just draw, I've just sketched the VLE curve in green on the right. The first kind of step that you do is to label ZA on the 45 degree line. So what you're going to do is locate the position, the composition of, of ZA, the, the overall amount of, of A in the feed. And in this case, just estimating, um, we can see that ZA is around 0 0.5. So the mixture of A going into the feed stream, whether it's in any phase, on average, you know, the average mixture is 50% A. So we are then going to define this quantity called a Q line or an operating line. And it's a linear line that connects the equilibrium line, the first blue dot here that I've drawn. And um, this 45 degree line. So you can go through the, the whole derivation of this line on your own time. I've listed the pages where it is. This line can be derived from the mole balance around the separator. And what you can see is that the key piece of information you need to know it, for this operating line is V over F. So um, right here, this is, a, this is that important system variable as well as ZA. So um, what this does is it relates YA and XA. And from here, the connection between the operating line and the equilibrium line, so the, or the 45 degree line and the equilibrium line, this is telling you the composition of the output stream. So um, in V, we know that YA will be the composition there. And we can kind of just trace over here. And I would say that that number is around two thirds. And then we can also get the composition of A in the liquid stream by tracing down to the X axis. And that looks to be around uh, 0 0.2. I'm kind of just eyeballing it here. And in a real problem, you would have um, the actual data, but you, you, get, you get the concept here. So what we've done now is we know how much Feed. We know the molar flow rate coming in. We, um, sorry, I just dropped my pen. Um, we know the fraction of feed that's vaporized. So we can then calculate V, how much material is coming out. That specifies L. So the molar flow rates are all specified and the compositions are all specified. So binary analysis of flash is pretty straightforward, especially if you've been given these two variables. The thing that I would encourage you to do is think about other ways that we can frame this problem. So for example, um, you could be asked, um, so if you're given, sorry, if you're given uh, YA and XA, then you can determine uh, V over F. That's another type of way to ask the exact same problem. There's a, you know, probably half a dozen different questions I could come up with where if you understand how to do this problem, you'll be able to kind of work that out. And if the only thing you understand is what I've written on this slide and, and this one example, you may struggle a little bit. So kind of do spend some time there kind of working through this concept. So binary systems are not that common. You know, in fact, the first example I wrote was a multi-component system. Um, and so what um, we want to do next is begin to think about how to do flash analysis in multi-component systems. So here, um, I'm going to draw the kind of common block flow diagram for a multi-component system. And I think what you have on your screen is just um, this flash drum. So 
kind of look at what I have here. Um, we're going to begin now to talk about degrees of freedom. In this case, the again, I just emphasize every flash drum does not have one or both of these things. So the um, we draw them now as we're beginning to think about flash drums as a reminder that we may use one or both of those items, but the process stream entering the flash drum may be exactly ready to be flashed and enter directly into um, that separator. So to totally specify this system, we would need um, the feed, uh, the feed flow rate, ZI, that's all the feed compositions, the enthalpy of the stream, as well as the temperature and the pressure. And you can see also that we have the exact same variables here coming out in the vapor and liquid phases. Um, the simplest example is just a pure liquid feed. And um, in the partial condenser, the other example I mentioned a few slides ago, the simplest example there is just a pure vapor feed. So with this in mind, when we, we begin to do hand calculations or Aspen calculations, the um, Isothermal flash is actually the only one that we're going to do by hand. Uh, and that process can be a little laborious. So I'm going to walk you through that today. Um, and then adiabatic flash can also be done by hand, but we normally don't in this class. And um, we would normally then um, uh, kind of go to Aspen and do that process simulation there. So uh, let's look at the, multi the, the way we do this calculation by hand, and you should expect um, one of these questions on homework or a quiz. Uh, this is an important kind of learning objective for the class. Um, the reading that I assigned goes into a pretty great detail on the Gibbs phase rule and all of the degrees of freedom and kind of how to analyze that. For the purposes of this class, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. We're going to just know that for the, the systems that we analyze, we will be talking about the phase rule and degrees of freedom with respect to just very quickly defining what are the unknown degrees of freedom. And it's typically going to be two. Uh, the distillation uh, examples that I can think of all have two, two unknown degrees of freedom. And we get at that by um, kind of first understanding what are the total degrees of freedom. The book has this laid out in great detail, and I'm not going to I'm choosing not to get into all the weeds because a lot of students um, kind of find it unnecessary, but uh, certainly ask questions on the discussion board if you want to know more about where we got this. But just take it, take for the, as truth for the sake of discussion today, that uh, isothermal and adiabatic systems for flash have C plus five total degrees of freedom. So C is the number of components, and then there's five additional degrees of freedom. Um, and, and generally, when we go about the design of these systems, we normally know C plus three degrees of freedom. And so those C plus three degrees of freedom would be typically specified right here. Um, this makes sense from the point of view of design. We kind of have specified the feed conditions. So we'll know the uh, feed flow rate, temperature and pressure, as well as the compositions. That's C plus three. So what, um, what we need to do then for the purpose of design in order to determine what's coming out of the flash drum is um, specify them. That's sort of an engineering constraint. We're going to say what the two degrees of freedom are. Or we need to kind of relate it to an additional unit operation if we are putting the flash drum in context of an entire plant design. Those degrees of freedom might actually be solved from other models for different unit operations upstream or downstream. So in the isothermal flash case, the example there, it, you're always going to be specifying the uh, temperature and pressure of the vapor. Um, these systems are in thermal and mechanical equilibrium, so that's, that will always wind up being the temperature and pressure of the liquid as well. And in the case of adiabatic flash, um, you specify that there's no heat exchange at all, and you're typically going to specify the pressure. Um, and then the temperature will be worked out as part of the solution. So that's about 35 minutes and we're about to get into um, quite about three or four slides of heavy math. I'm gonna pause here 
Um, we won't probably go through the whole time today, but I do want to just take a quick break so you guys can stretch your legs and uh, come back and ready to dive into um, a bunch of equations and think about how we're going to solve those equations. So let's come back at 1240 and um, we will jump right back in. Thanks. You can also send questions to chat or Jeremy right now in the interim and I'll answer them before we move on.
All right, let's um, jump back in. There's a couple questions that are great. Um, and I'm just cleaning up a blank page here to look at. Um, not sure what's going on with my app. Oh, perfect. Okay, let's um, take a couple quick questions. Somebody uh, asked a really good question about um, why the notes that I post um, have partial like words and things missing. And that's um, kind of my design by intention to um, get you paying attention and thinking about what is not on the slide. I post all the notes eventually. If you're finding that that's problematic and you uh, want the full note set, uh, certainly let me know. I got another question specifically about homework. Uh, I'm not gonna address that here. So whoever um, sent me a note about homework too, please talk to the TAs, um, schedule a meeting, et cetera. We don't have time in the lecture, unfortunately, to go through homework questions. I received another question about homework schedule. The plan is to have homework due on Wednesdays and you should be able to find all of that on the syllabus uh, as well as the exam, um, the exam uh, date that we selected. So specific questions about um, the analysis we just did. So I'm gonna kind of just quickly sketch here uh, one of our diagrams. This is the XY diagram here. And the first question was, is the Q line always normal to the 45 degree line? So the answer to that is no. Um, the slope of the Q line is given by this operating line equation that you can find on page 143. So it is as follows. So this, the slope of the, this is the Q line right here. It's, oh, it's a linear y, you know, it's y equals mx plus b if you look at the slope and y intercept. And the slope of this line is so remember that v over f is the ratio, the fraction of the feed that's vaporized. Um, and so you can see that the um, for the flash drum, the slope is always going to be negative or um, zero. So if we vaporized all of the feed which we'll talk about at the very end of class, then the slope would be zero. Otherwise, if we're only vaporizing a part of the feed, the slope will always be negative, which means that it will always initiate from some point on the 45 degree line and then uh, have worked backwards this way. So we can have um, a slope of, uh, yeah. So from that, you, you can begin to, um, if 100% of the feed is vaporized is zero and if 0% of the feed is vaporized. Um, so if it were a liquid, then what would happen? The slope would be exactly like that. So that's the first question. Um, the second question, um, how do I know which points to connect to draw the Q line? So as a reminder, uh, the 45 degree line, that's ZA, that's the feed composition. So step one, we create, uh, the we, we initiate the Q line or the operating line from the 45 degree line. And then we know the slope. So then we can begin to draw the Q line because we've calculated as the example um, here, we have calculated the slope using this relationship. So then the Q line extends from the 45 degree line and it connects with the equilibrium line. And so that tells us what is going to be the equilibrium composition in the flash drum. We get the vapor phase composition, YA, and we get the liquid phase composition, XA, uh, from the equilibrium curve. So that's kind of this point right here in the question that I posed today is the answer. It is, uh, what is the composition coming out of the flash drum? We'll provide another example, and this will come up again in the recitation. Um, so uh, hopefully, I think that answers. Um, oh, there's one more question. Uh, why does a 45 degree line meet at the azeotrope? Okay, so this is about the concept of the azeotrope and, and how we see that in these examples. So let's sketch our example here. And so I'm gonna draw an exaggerated azeotrope now to answer this question. So let's see, we have, so, what happens here, so I, that's exactly right. There's two different things that could happen. 
it could exactly meet the aviotrope. Um, so the, the most important concept is right here. And for the moment, don't worry about everything that's above or beyond um, the, the aziotrope. So what I'm showing you right here is that XA equals YA. That's the definition of the 45 degree line. And at that component or at that point right there, any vapor that's leaving the liquid is going to have the exact same composition as the liquid. So for a multi-component system, that means that uh, when, we, when we heat it and we begin to vaporize it, if, if the uh, vapor and liquid are non-ideal and they begin to, to kind of evaporate with the exact same ratio of A and B or any other number of components, that's kind of the definition of an azeotrope. Um, so then the question was, well, what, what, what happens after the azeotrope? And wouldn't you actually see um, a behavior like this? where so you can find a number of different VLE curves so this is another so this is also possible where um, there, there's no when systems are non-ideal we're not guaranteed to have one or the other and the thing to focus on here uh, is that intersection point that's the azeotrope and that's what we really need to understand in this diagram that I just sketched on the right hand side of the azeotrope the component A actually becomes less volatile than component B. Um, at the azeotrope, they are equally volatile. So that's the really important thing. Um, so we don't really, we're not guaranteed that after the azeotrope, component A will become um, less volatile. It could sort of level off at that point, so to speak. So uh, I think this latter example is more common, but I did just really want to focus on the what the definition of the azeotrope was and how you define, how you, um, get it from the uh, graphical analysis. Okay, so I don't see any other questions. Let's move on now. Uh, remember right before the break, we were at talking about isothermal design. Now I'm gonna show you an algebraic method um, for doing uh, isothermal design. So section 4.4 discusses, discusses this in details. And remember that in the isothermal case, I'm gonna go through these formulas on the right-hand side in some detail, so don't, um, you don't have to rush to, to write them all down. I mean, the bullets on the left here. In the isothermal case, uh, we have to specify the missing variables. And the implication is once we do that, I wanna point out, we are gonna calculate, uh, we can calculate Ki, the, um, the partition coefficients for all the species. Um, so let's kind of walk through what can be found in, um, Table 4.4, if you want to really go in your book in great detail, but this has all the needed equations. All the purple stuff you don't have on your slide in front of you, and um, I'll pause at the end and make sure that I've answered all the questions that come up. So here's kind of just a process, that, like this is a, an SOP for doing uh, what's called the Ratchford rice procedure, um, who, who designed this process for algebraic analysis. We're now in multi-component. So we can have as many components as we want, provided we have all the data, so uh, beyond binary. So again, temperature and pressure are specified. And we're going to define this new variable psi, which is the ratio of V to F. So at the beginning of this um, analysis, we don't know the ratio of V to F. If we did, we could probably solve everything, uh, given that temperature and pressure are known but we don't know that. And that's kind of the purpose of this analysis is to be able to solve the compositions as well as the flow rates for the whole system. So if you do a mole balance on all the species and you can do this by hand and, and come up with these relations, again, I'm not gonna derive these relationships um, today in class, but um, we can take them you know, at face value, they are, I believe, derived in the book, or I can, I can certainly help you with it if you want to know how they're derived. For each species, we can define Xi and Yi. So that'd be the, the liquid phase mole fraction and the vapor phase mole fraction coming out of the flash drum. And so what it looks like is the following. So for Xi, um, we have a ratio of Zi, that's the component, the overall component coming into the feed. And then this quantity in, in the denominator which includes this unknown variable psi, as well as the partition coefficient ki. 
And again, this is being derived from a mass balance or a mole balance on all the species. So I don't expect you to instantly understand where this equation came from. Just trust me that it is the, the liquid phase mole fraction Xi for this species. And I'll just remind you that um, when you, the, we, have, we always have this in our back pocket, that the summation of Xi is always one. So YI, this is, this is simply the definition from the Routes law for ideal system here. We can define all of that. Um, and then when you plug in Xi into that equation, this is the relationship you get for YI right here. Um, and we also have, so all I've done is I've plugged in Xi, my definition from the top. And then I've got the summation, of course, of all the mole fractions are, are by definition one. So um, this is one of those derivations that then includes a weird step that probably you would not have thought about, no problem. But there's, um, we can basically just rewrite the summation of X and summation of Y. So this is just saying that one minus one is zero, no big deal. Um, and I'm gonna plug everything in there. Um, so a question just came in, is it only for ideal systems? And the answer is no, but then we would have the modified Routes law in that case. So um, we would have a fugacity if there was not ideal gas and we'd have an activity coefficient for each species if it was not ideal liquid. That would require additional information to be calculated, but it's, it's certainly possible. We will only analyze this for ideal systems in this class. And for non-ideal systems, we would use ASKIN. So once we have this, here's what's gonna happen. Um, there is a substitution and rearrangement of all of the YIs and all of the XIs. So kind of what I'm doing, I'm gonna trace with my highlighter. I've got my XIs right here. I have my YIs right here. I have this relationship that's set equal to zero. And when I substitute all of that, I get this quantity right here, this equation. So um, it's an equation, it's one very long non-linear non equation, f of psi. So uh, the only unknown variable in that equation is psi. And as a reminder, um, that psi is the fraction of feed that's vaporized. So I'm just gonna pause a second here. Again, the point now is not that you can derive all this on your own. I don't, uh, I'm not gonna sort of make that a learning objective of the class. I think it's good to understand the derivation, but at minimum you need to sort of under, accept that these relationships define the mole balance around the isothermal flash system. And see at the bottom and step five, it's really important to understand that this is kind of a, a complex nonlinear equation the function of zi and ki. And if you write it all out, say for three or four components, it's not gonna be something that you just solve by hand. This is um, typically something that we're gonna use a computer program for. Um, in the book, you can find uh, equations 410 and 411. And these equations uh, show how to apply Newton's method. So you may have seen this in like uh, a math 301 or your calculus class. It takes a derivative of this equation, and then uh, it shows us how to minimize the derivative and find the, the minimum or the solution to this equation. Um, you can also um, do guess and check with your calculator. Um, you can use Excel to solve this. You can use MATLAB or Python. There's a lot of different ways that you can solve this, but you certainly should expect that you'll be analyzing flash systems and homework and quiz, and um, you should become familiar with these equations. So. I'm gonna pause just for a moment before we move on to the um, kind of remaining two examples that are so, kind of just different versions of this same problem. And then we'll talk about adiabatic at the, at the end. So if there's any additional questions, uh, now's the moment. I'll just wait and see um, if I see anything coming in from Jeremy. Or again, if you wanna ask the question yourself, you're welcome to just uh, raise hand and I'll call on you.
Okay, so the broad kind of generic example of the um, this this uh, isothermal flash is sort of an unknown value uh, v or f um, v over f ratio, and so we'll eventually solve for that, and um, um, that's given a certain temperature and pressure. Another thing we can do is use this to analyze systems that are operating at the bubble point or dew point. And this may be for the specific case in which we want to design a flash separator that creates a bubble point liquid or a dew point vapor. And so those you'll remember from your prior classes are special thermodynamic conditions in which any additional heat added to the system in the bubble point will begin to create vapor and any additional heat removed from a vapor, um, it's right at that position where you'll begin to condense liquid. So it's useful to be able to determine bubble point and dew point. Um, and, and that's this is how um, it works. So the observation here is that a flash drum that's operating right at the bubble point will actually have a vapor flow of zero. So we've specified V. So what that does, just kind of following through the analysis we did on the last slide, is the following. It sets psi V over F equal to zero, which then means our function F of psi, F of zero, is gonna be equal to zero. And we can simplify F of zero very uh, quickly by kind of following through that equation on the last slide. And what you wind up with when you simplify that is this relationship right here. So you have a summation of zi and ki, and those have to be equal to one. So the product of all the species, um, mole fractions in the feed times the partition coefficients. So what you're doing in this case is solving for t. Specifically the bubble point temperature. So again, this would be another example of a set of nonlinear equations and you'd have to um, solve that yourself. So um, that is how we can analyze using this method, uh, the bubble point of a system. Um, likewise, the dew point happens in the exact same way. So in the dew point calculation, we observe that the system uh, is all vapor. We're creating a saturated vapor so there'll be no liquid, and therefore V over F will be one. Our function F of one then is equal to zero. And we can carry through that, uh, again, simplifying the equation and coming up with this relationship right here, where you have ZI over KI just by virtue of the algebra that gets worked out. This is equal to one, and we're gonna here solve for one temperature. That's, there's only one unknown variable there and we're gonna solve for the dew point. So that, um, that carries us through uh, two additional uses um, that are special cases, but quite common in industry uh, in terms of um, types of flow rates that you might wanna generate in your process. You can imagine that you might not, um, you may want to simply generate a saturated liquid because of it may be used in a reactor downstream or a different separator. Likewise, you may want to generate only a saturated vapor from your stream. So there's lots of reasons that you would use this type of analysis and this type of very simple unit operation to change the phase of your system. Uh, reasons in addition to just doing a split. That first reason I mentioned, a split of the most volatile component. So flash drums do find quite a lot of use in industry for uh, when you're designing processes. You'll see this when you do process design in 485, because you'll have to take a process stream uh, and, and kind of deliver it at a, at a different condition. Uh, and the flash separator is sort of normally the, the main way we do that. So I think I see a question coming in. Um, and the answer is, uh, would a superheated uh, vapor also not have a psi of one? So absolutely, that's totally true. So any uh, super cooled liquid would also have um, a psi of zero, however, we're specifically noting here um, that I'm trying to think of, sorry, let me just kind of think. Um, oh, so the, the partition coefficient Ki is defined um, 
so that the system is not going to be superheated or subcooled. So we have uh, an equilibrium situation there. So that's why in this specific case with the Ratchford race procedure, when we solve around uh, psi zero for the bubble point or psi one for the dew point, uh, the temperature that we solve for, uh, because we're using those Ki values, is going to be the, the respective bu uh, bubble point and dew point. So good question. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, so the last type of flash drum that we're going to encounter uh, kind of very quickly becomes more complicated than we want to solve analytically, at least in Chemi 435. This is the adiabatic flash. So what we haven't, um, just kind of noting here at the bottom, in the isothermal flash case, we have some temperature in the feed Um, and we have a temperature in liquid and a temperature, uh, temp vapor temperature and a liquid temperature. And we sort of assumed, um, we haven't specified it exactly, that Q, the heat in this, um, the heat loss or gain in this system is going to be non-zero, um, simply because we haven't defined it. There, there, there could be cases in which Q is effectively zero because of the composition, et cetera. But um, there are examples in which we operate the flash adiabatically. And so in that case, uh, the flash drum is totally insulated. There's no heat transfer in or out to the environment. And as a result, this additional constraint of Q equals zero becomes a factor. And then the equations become much kind of uh, more complicated to the extent that we're solving the temperature of the flash drum um, as well as um, the, the, the value of psi V over F. So there's two, there's two unknowns and you get an extra equation. I'll kind of refer you to section 443 in your book there where those equations are. Um, since we're gonna be using Aspen to solve this uh, adiabatic system, we're not going to um, do a lot of these hand calculations and I'm not gonna dwell on it too much in class because of the sort of shortened quarter and um, you know trying to streamline everything you guys need for success as you leave this class, both in the rest of the curriculum and things you might encounter in industry. So I wasn't sure how long this was gonna take today because of potential questions. And um, so we're gonna finish a little early. I'm gonna stop here and note that what we'll do on Thursday is ternary liquid liquid design. We're gonna wrap up module one, and then we're gonna spend the rest of the time doing Aspen and introductions to Aspen. Um, you're mostly gonna be following along with me uh, while I share my screen on Zoom. And so I think the goal on Thursday for you should not necessarily be to try and also follow along on the fly, although you could if you want to, but the session will be recorded so you can go back later and access Aspen from your, your home computer and then kind of repeat what we've done in class. Um, so we'll do some basic Aspen calculations, um, to kind of cover some of the thermodynamic analyses we've done, and we'll do isothermal and adiabatic flash calculations. So um, that's all I've got for today. Uh, we're going to wrap up a little bit early. I'll stick around if people have questions. And again, you can um, send the question through Jeremy. You can raise your hand and unmute your mic, or you can um, send a chat, and I'll stay till all the questions are done. Otherwise, um, this concludes class. Have a great day, and I will. Um, See you guys on Thursday. Okay, so equation came in and this is related to um, mass transfer. 
the equation is um, in the sort of mass version that we wrote for uh, Fickian diffusion. Where W is the weight fraction, um, what density would we use? And that's the, going to be the, um, the total mass density of the system. So this is going to be diffusion or mass transfer in a single phase. Uh, so it'd be a gas or liquid. W is the weight fraction. And then we would, um, uh, yeah, so it's whatever it, you could calculate the density um, or it would be provided to you. All right, I don't see any additional questions coming in. There's none in my chat and I don't see any coming in from Jeremy. Um, Jeremy, do you wanna unmute and confirm that no one else has sent, sent you any questions? Uh, I haven't seen any other ones. So. Okay, so last call, Bing. All right, have a great Tuesday and I'll see you guys later.